Hello, everyone, and welcome to this SNEA Networking Storage Forum webcast, Protecting Data at Rest, the second in a series on storage and networking security. My name is Steve Vanderlinden. I am a system engineer at Lenovo Data Center Group, and I'll be your moderator today. We have a great panel of security experts for today's webcast. I'm joined by my Lenovo colleague, Pierre Moulin. Pierre is a security architect with over 15 years of experience in application and product security. Hi, Pierre. Hi, Steve. Also presenting is Dr. Ahmad Atamli. Dr. Atamli is a security expert at Mellanox Technologies and holds a PhD in system security from the University of Oxford. Dr. Atamli has published world-class academic articles in ACM, IEEE, Springer, and many others and holds several patents in the security field. He has experience in a wide variety of security domains. Dr. Atamli leads the research and development of host introspection at Mellanox, a novel approach to detecting malicious activities in cloud platforms. Greetings, Ahmad. Hello, Steve. Before we dive in, I want to share a little bit about SNEA. SNEA is a nonprofit global organization dedicated to developing standards and educational programs to advance storage and information technology. We have 185 leading organizations participating in SNEA, 2,000 active members, and reach over 50,000 IT end users and storage professionals worldwide. As you can see, the NSF covers a broad range of storage-related topics through educational webcast webcasts like this one, as well as blogs and presentations at industry events. Just a quick note from our legal department. The presentation you'll see today is copyrighted by SNEA, unless otherwise noted. SNEA members may use this pre presentation as long as it is used in its entirety and SNEA is credited. There are no warranties expressed or implied. Use at your own risk. And here's today's agenda. The second in a series of storage security webcasts focusing on protecting data at rest. Please note that you can access today's slides from the attachment tab at the bottom of your Bright Talk viewing console. They will also be posted on the NSF web page on SNEA.org. Related webcasts will be listed at the end of this presentation. Note that you may also ask questions during this presentation via the chat window, and we will answer as many as we can in the time we have left. The remainder will be answered after the webcast is over and posted to our Q&A blog on SNEA.org. Keep in mind, we are all working remotely these days. Network access may affect the quality of our webcast, but as long as we can keep our kids from gaming during this webcast, we should be okay. So now, I'd like to turn it over to Ahmad to kick us off. Ahmad? Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Um, it's an exciting time to be talking about cyber security and protecting data at rest. Uh, I want to start with my first slide by talking about the last decade in cybersecurity and attacks, we have seen many changes and cyber crimin criminals have been gaining uh, more skills and stronger in attacking uh, systems. There are many of the security premises that we've known for many decades uh, tend to be broken now. Some, some start with the heartbeat vulnerability where we had a vulnerability there for more, more than a decade until we found and we're still having a problem recovering from it. Some premises about remote attack are not being able to exploit hardware that was working on many CPUs and over the network as well, and we're able to hack into systems that are completely isolated for and remote from, from, uh, from the user. So it's quite a tough time because we need to rethink about all those and think about how we protecting all this data. And the last thing before I go to my next slide is how ransomware now is also affecting our data at rest and becoming 
a massive risk that we need to, to consider when we have this old security concern. So before I talking about protecting um, data at risk, we need to understand what are those threats. When you think about those threats, they are coming from many different places. That has to do with the circumstances or the environment. Uh, some data might be present only on your phone, on your iPad, on your work computer. That make it a single point of fear. There is a problem with your device, uh, somehow manufacturing fault or a human error, uh, your hard drive collapsed somehow all the data is lost now. This is one of the main sources of how we can lose data today. The second source we're talking about is the compliance. Some data needs to be accessed only by specific individuals to, to protect it and to restrict who can seize confidential data. Another data needs to be specific, present in specific location uh, or a medium that doesn't necessarily have the right infrastructure to um, maintain copies and in case of failure, if something goes wrong. Direct classes that we know of, a device gets uh, stolen or other ransom, ransomware, which uh, we'll talk about later on by Mike Deep, yeah. So today we are living in a complex world. A few years ago, we all have our own machines, our servers, our laptops, and we used to the model where we stored our data in one device, and if we protect this device, that means we are able to protect our data as well. But now we are moving to a world where, where data is spread everywhere, and our data is rest is no more on our mobile phone or on our laptop or our uh, <coughs> desktop machine, or one server that is present at one physical location. So this data travel creates uh, more risk to the data at the different hubs. In a cloud model, things move from the edge, to the fog, to the cloud, many different devices, different capabilities. And to, to illustrate this, if you look at this slide, everything is far from my laptop, that are at rest. You go through the, the path, it goes through some firewall. That firewall goes to another server in order to give better performance and to provide the right premises of uh, availability and uh, recovery of data goes to us. We design infrastructure that store data at rest everywhere. Multiple servers, not necessarily in the same location, we archive it, it's present everywhere. The data can move anywhere and it can be vulnerable. Having more hope, that means someone, someone is gonna, might get access to it and it might be a threat. This is the premises that we have to deal with. This is what we have to consider when we're talking about security. Now the issue with data at rest there are many things uh, to consider, and I later on will talk about a bit more about the cryptography side of it. When we have data at rest, there's firewalls involved, there is an antivirus involved. Who's going to access this data? Who's going to be enforcing and prevent access by a specific individual? What happens in case someone hacks into my remote server? How can I get guaranteed that this data is still good? Someone else is not replacing it. Someone else not stealing it. There's many threats to, to consider. And it's very easy to forget about data. If you're accessing this data every day, then I will remember about it. But if I leave it there and come back another year, most likely I won't remember which devices is what's stored. If I'm going to sell a specific device, I might sell this device with specific information. 
This is also another sort of leak of data. Having all these risks in mind, you need to consider how do you create an environment where the data at rest is protected by design. From the beginning, you have the right consideration to, to protect the data at rest. So in, when you get to these cases, you will still be secure and protected. And of course, the <clears throat> What complicates things even more when you consider all those compliances. And the compliances are there for good reason. In Europe, we are seeing more movement toward GDPR, many of uh, the organization moving to encrypt their, their data in order to avoid paying penalty in case of a uh, leak in an environment. There is more law like in the UK that data is not allowed to, to be stored um, in the premises for more than one year, and so on. The organization have to guarantee that some data is uh, erased after some time. They need to comply with all these regulations. Many, many documents to understand and connect the dots in order to implement system that would assure protection of the data. We need to comply for, for the healthcare private healthcare information, we need, we have more uh, severe requirements like the HIPAA requirements where have different requests from data encryption at rest about changing keys, where are keys being stored, who can access the key, and uh, what is the model for the cloud provider in managing the key and giving this protection measure. And overall, <clears throat> and another situation that we need to comply with is the NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology, which provides many specifications for cryptography and uh, guidelines for how to protect data at rest. And we need to consider all these specifications. We need to con consider what is in you, what is outdated, what is accepted today, in the world and what is not accepted. So I have to consider all that when we're talking about data at rest. Now, coming to the core of data at rest, we need to protect it. We established there are many threats. And here are the part where we're talking about how can we protect data at rest. But to understand how the means of protecting data at rest, we have to use cryptography. However, cryptography was initially designed to protect data in motion. The whole premises of Alice and Bob wanting to communicate with each other and having Mallory in the middle trying to eavesdrop in the conversation. In this example, the keys that are used in order to encrypt such channel are short-lived. We call them session keys for a reason. The time for these keys do not live more than sometimes merely a few seconds, minutes, hours. That means the risk for those keys are not as high as keys that I need to use for protecting um, data at rest. In order to use cryptography to protect data at rest, I need to think about my keys and how long they are going to live. Where am I going to store those keys? who are going to have access to them. What does it mean if someone have access to that key? What does happen all the version that encrypted to this key? If this key gets lost, does that mean that my data gets lost as well? They have no possibility to retain my data. Now, limiting access to key is one thing to do. I want to use cryptography in order to protect the data when it's stored somewhere, so when someone has access to it, cannot figure out what is the data that I'm trying to, to protect, the confidentiality property. The integrity property being guaranteed using another cryptographic measures 
to guarantee that uh, an attacker can't manipulate the data and change it to something else or moving it to a previous data. However, this is all good as long as an remote attacker doesn't have access to, to the system. If the cryptography rendered unuseful because the system itself is being hacked or being manipulated with, or the remote attacker have access to my keys, then the mechanism that I'm using are no longer valid. In this case, the best cryptography that I can have, for instance, like using a very large key to make it much harder for an attacker to try to figure out what is that key that I'm using, is not useful anymore. Because the remote attacker have direct access. So we need to think about how to protect those keys even in the presence of remote attacks. Remote attacks can happen at any time. There are software vulnerability are everywhere. So those key assets are the root to my data. We need to protect them at any cost and we need some measures in place that even in the unlikely event of an attack happening, my key will still be protected. We cannot rely on communication security to protect our key. We need to make sure that the right system also in place by employing key man the right key management solution in order to protect the key. When we're talking about keys, this is all the premises of the key management. We talked about there's a life cycle of a key and how important it is to protect the key. This is where key management comes in, and I'm going to quote uh, Bruce Schneider from the book Applied Cryptography, key management is one of the hardest subjects in security. It's really not easy to, to come up with a key management solution that meets all your requirements and still secure. If I have a cryptographic key and you break it once, you figure that key we can access now all this data. So the data is very important to protect, but the key is my, my route to accessing this data. So if the root key is not protected to the full major, then the attacker will gain access. The question we need to ask ourselves when protecting a key, where do we store a key? If we store the key in a file system, we go back to my previous argument from my previous slide about what happens in case of software vulnerability. Someone will not be able to view that key. If I don't have the right policy in place to allow access to that key, then an attacker will be able to decrypt all my data. If it's easy to go and delete that key and I don't have the right system, in place to replicate this key and protect it at any cost and recover in case of damage happened to one version of the key, then my data is lost. The most of the exposure, in fact, come from, uh, from the time I'm using the key. With the key, the more the key is in use, the more it's at risk because it will be easier for software to come and exploit software vulnerabilities in place and try to figure out that key. So how do we protect keys? We normally want to think about what is the frequency axis of that key. We need to think about that attack that can happen on keys in order to figure out data. Sometimes we don't need a specific key in order to figure out what is the data that is encrypted. Today, one of uh, the well-known attacks called plain text cover text, where I can map the entire English dictionary. I can know exactly which cipher text and plain text match the entire key. In that case, I don't really need to know what is the key in place. I already figure out every matching plain text and 
five or six to hold them. Solutions that are implemented in, in software, key management solution, where again, we're back to square one because we risk exposure. We don't know who's accessing that key. Software solutions are not to have um, side channel. Um, they don't have side channel mitigation. And without the proper access, anyone can access to the key. Cryptography also is a very sensitive topic when we're talking about key management because those keys need to be protected somehow as well and cryptography applied, not only the cryptography is applied for data at rest, but also for the key itself. And this is where something, uh, some sophistication uh, by NEST are quite important. Because one mistake in a cryptographic implementation might make the algorithm completely useless and crackable, even something. Give you an example today about um, an attack that happened from a very long time ago in the last 10 years with the hash function. With the hash function, it's known that if you change one bit in the input, you end up changing more than half of the bits in the output. There was a single tiny implementation change in the implementation of this function. And you didn't have the same property that uh, the hash function provided anymore. And it ch in one change ended up causing only one change in the result function, making it unsecure. So this is a sensitive topic. We have to comply with whatever specific cryptographic specification provided by NEST, have many eyes on it, and guaranteed to be working right. We can't play around with cryptography. We can't invent our own. We have to comply with what's out there and trusted. And for that, there are many specifications like NIST and uh, FIPS out there to, to help design those protocols. And lastly, before I pass to my uh, colleague Pierre, a uh, topic that we'll touch on in June, in a few weeks, how do you protect those keys today, and what are the premises in place? So we want to reduce the risk of those keys, as the exposure of those keys as much as possible, because they are the root for, for our data. And this the question to be asked here, what do we trust? If we can't trust software, if we can't trust policy, if we can't trust the operating system in place to enforce access, then what can we trust? We can trust what cannot change. The common practice today for um, implementing key management solution is more to rely on the hardware. If I have the hardware in place protecting the key, that key is never exposed outside. Some, some keys even cannot be seen by the user himself. Today, key, ma key managers, like using TPM or HSM, they don't even ex expose those keys to the user. They are generated internally, and they can be used. And in order to restrict access for their own using keys, they have their own specific policy enforced within the de specific device itself and prevent software or remote attacker from trying to exploit um, some weaknesses, cryptography, or di give it direct access to the key. So someone like your neighbor, your admin, your operating system cannot go wild and try to crack that key. These, these key managers are designed in place to withstand attack of the sort that I mentioned. Today we are seeing on the market also more hardware components coming in place, what we call them confidentiality preserving. We're seeing more trend in the key management that we'll be talking about in, in June about how to keep the keys from being exposed to software whatsoever in order to risk um, the exposure time with those keys. This way, I can maintain a longer lifetime for those keys and if needed, replace them internally without the exposure or, or make the the keys exposed to specific user. 
And now I will pass my <coughs> pass it to my peer, uh, to my colleague Pierre. We will talk about uh, ransomware. Thanks, Amai. Okay, so let's start off by about <coughs> with describing what ransomware is. So really, uh, it's a form of malware that encrypts the victim's file. At its simplest description. So, and I'm pretty sure most of you have have heard or seen some form of ransomware. So the the attacker simply um, runs an executable that encrypts the user's file and then demands a ransom um, for providing the key to encrypt those files. Um, there are a number of ways where attackers can can get gain access to execute a ransomware attack. Um, one of the most common ones is uh, via phishing spam, where uh, phishing emails uh, are sent to unsuspected users. Users would click on the link, which downloads uh, downloads a software that would uh, or a ransomware that would encrypt all their data. Um, the other uh, the other form is by exploiting security vulnerabilities. So whether it be it in the OS or really any applications running on the system that are uh, externally accessible. Um, and ransomware attacks are not limited to organizations or certain types of individuals. It's really um, everybody is a potential target. And um, we've seen examples of ransomware um, going uh, after individual users, asking for a few hundred dollars to to provide the keys to ransomware attacks against large corporations, where the ask was in the, in the tens of millions of dollars. So, what is why is ransomware such a big deal? What what is the the cost behind a ransomware? Um, given the simplicity of the attack and and um, how how common it has been lately. Um, it is one of the fast growing hazards of the 21st century. And, and um, some of the most prominent examples of ransomware, I'm sure some of you have heard about, is WannaCry in 2017, which impacted the United Kingdom's National, National Health Service, where over 200,000 computers were infected, and it brought hundreds of facilities uh, to a standstill for several days, which resulted in cancer surgeries and procedures and so on. Another one was around, um, another attack was against the Erie County Medical Center in New York, where the cost to recover from that was uh, was over $10, ten million dollars. Um, a third one from a few years ago was against tech vendor Nuance, where the attack cost was estimated to be around $68 million dollars between recovery and refunds to customer and lost business and so on. Um, and the projection for um, the, the cost, uh, whether it be a transoms or to recover from ransomware attacks, is has been surging exponentially and is expected to reach over $11 billion this year. So how do we safeguard against ransom, ransomware? Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are mainly two vectors for ransomware, either by exploiting a vulnerability in the system or by using phishing emails. So really to protect against ransomware, we, we need to safeguard against those two, those two attack vectors. So the first one, to ensure that systems are kept up to date. So we want to make sure that there's no vulnerable uh, software on our computers um, that can potentially be used to, to, to uh, trigger a ransomware attack. Um, the other one is to perform frequent backups and verify backups regularly. This one, this way, in case a ransomware does um, does um, a ransomware attack does succeed, we would have backup um, of our data to where we can quickly restore that data and 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 address the the attack. Um, we want to make sure that the ransomware doesn't spread to the backups. So we want to store those backups separately, ideally on devices that are not network accessible. And lastly, to address the issue with phishing emails, we want to make sure that our, our staff and our organizations are properly trained. So um, provide regular cybersecurity awareness training, help them identify 
what uh, what phishing um, phishing attacks look like, and and implement phishing assessments that simulate real world phishing emails. There are companies that specialize in providing training and providing assessments, where they would do exercises and, and generate um, phishing emails to uh, to track. Um, uh, the percentage of employees in a given organization that are, are probably identifying emails, uh, probably identifying phishing emails, as opposed to clicking on the links, and that has proven to be a very good deterrent against um, against that particular attack vector. So, I mentioned on the previous slide that uh, one of the ways to um, to safeguard against ransomware and to be able to quickly recover is is data backups, but validating the import, validating the, that data backups are um, are um, are still healthy and, and, and that data is still um, is still um, intact is, is very important. Um, data backups can be accidentally erased or or become corrupted or invalid uh, for a number of number of reasons. Um, so we want to make sure that they're validated on a regular basis, so we don't want to just create a backup and kind of forget about it because um, even if that backup is safeguarded, there is nothing to say that uh, potentially the disk that's holding that backup has become corrupted or somebody accidentally erased that backup um, or, or, um, or, or that backup became inaccessible for some reason. So we want to make sure that we're validating that the backup is still accessible and it's still is still um, intact um, as an extra layer of protection against ransomware, as I, as I mentioned, um, and also to provide um, the, the the assurances that uh, the organization organization can handle um, a disaster recovery. So to wrap it up, um, cyber criminals capabilities are on the rise and attacks are getting stealth here. Um, data backup and data arrest can be easily um, disregarded um, or, or forgotten when data is um, is not uh, is not encrypted and probably safeguarded and backed up. Um, cryptographic keys are one of the pillars of, of uh, such, uh, such protections um, oh, for protecting data at rest. And protecting the keys is, is in itself one of the one of the biggest challenges in in this domain. Um, and, and really, having data address compromise can be detrimental to organizations due to a number of, of of reasons that I mentioned earlier, from from loss of business to uh, to lawsuits and and, and so on. Um, so we want to make sure that the data is is backed up on a regular basis. We want to make sure that the data is properly validated on a regular basis, so that we would be uh, prepared for for this type of um, um, attacks. Um, and that's it. I'll hand it back over to Steve. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ahmad and Pierre, very much for that. Uh, we do have a question uh, that came in around master encryption keys. Um, since master encry encryption keys are stored on the storage device per uh, TCG specs, if that device fails, then you can't get at the uh, master encryption key to sanitize it or uh, you know, decommission it. So would it be better if that master encryption key were actually stored in a key management system or possibly a hardware security module? What's your thoughts on that, Pierre? Yeah, so uh, yeah. it really depends yeah, on. depend on the compliance. It depends on the compliances and uh, the requirements. So I think storing a uh, master encryption key on the storage device is absolutely not an option when you're talking about HIPAA because there are some models where you have to bring your own key. Now, it would be a valid solution to have some of those devices, but I wouldn't say they are um, um, valid in every option. So the other thing to consider when, when talking about key, and I mentioned it slightly in my slides, and it will be discussed uh, further in June, 
um, is about the protection measure. HSMs need to be high, high level of security, very high. That means not only software attacks. You could have a physical access and try to um, have sophisticated equipment and so on, try to get the key, and you'll still uh, be protected. That's not the luxury that you will get with every storage device. So it really depends on the requirement. I would say if you want a high level of uh, protection for keys, sometimes it just sends all the way. All right, thank you. Um, the next statement or uh, question is around the state of the art of uh, protecting data. Companies like Rubrik claim to have a solution. Um, can you comment on, uh, you know, the state of the art in data protection and what gaps may uh, still be uh, there in existing products? Pierre, do you have any comments on that? So I'm not familiar with the rubric solution, um, but. And, it, and there's really not going to be a one size fits all. Um, it really depends on, on on really the individual requirements and, and, and situation. Um, there are um, there are some solutions that will take regular backups um, uh, or automated backups on regular intervals. Um, it's really the controls around the solution and the control around who has access to the data and who has access to the backups um, that that matter more than the backup, you know, the backup process itself. Um, but again, there's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, I can provide some follow up information on that uh, rubric solution, and I will do some reading up on it. Yes, thank you. We can uh, enhance on that in the Q&A blog when we post that. Uh, one more question is, um, if the data at rest is encrypted, is it actually still vulnerable to ransomware attack? Yeah, I mean, the fact that it's encrypted or not doesn't really is irrelevant because even if it's encrypted, a ransomware attack will encrypt that encrypted data and you will not be able to decrypt it without having that key that was used to encrypt it or re-encrypt in the ransomware attack. Uh, that's a good point. I see uh, how, you, how you come to that. Okay. All right. That's all the questions we have. Um, thanks again, Ahmad and Pierre. Uh, reminder that this is part of a series on storage network security. The next one is uh, June 10th. We'll be taking a deeper dive into key management. And I hope you'll join us then. Please also follow us on Twitter at SNIANSF to keep up on the latest storage networking technology and future webcasts. So after this um, webcast, we hope that you'll rate um, what the quality of the information that you were given here. Uh, we do value your feedback, and we'll use it to improve future presentations. You can get a remind, uh, as a reminder, you can get a copy of today's presentation on the attachment tab on your Bright Talk session, or you'll be able to get that at the SNEA website at SNEA.org. Uh, so we'll follow up with answers to the Q&As in uh, the next week or two and address all the questions that we received and any that might come in afterwards. That concludes today's webcast on protecting data at rest. We hope you found this information of value and encourage you to share it with your colleagues. Thank you.